Wait, what the? That's not right. What did I do? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today, I'm going to make some tea nuts for my mill, and this is a great beginner project. If you've been following my mill skills series and you're itching to make something useful, this is a fantastic first project. I happen to need some, so I'm going to walk you through how I make them. I'm going to make these guys eh, nicer than necessary, but I'm going to show you where you can take shortcuts and, uh, you know, we'll show you lots of techniques along the way. Okay, let's go. What is a tea nut and why do we need them? Well, they look like this. They're T-shaped and they're a nut and they go in slots on mill tables and drill presses and lathe chucks and lots of other things that have T slots in them. And why would you need to make them? Well, because they come in different sizes that may not match your mill, but you can order them in different sizes. So why would you bother making them? Well, I don't know, hypothetically, maybe it's a Sunday and there's some sort of global pandemic on and you can't get anything shipped. And you know, that's a obviously a ridiculously contrived example that would never happen. But the point is there might be a circumstance in which you'd like to make some. And like everybody else, you probably bought one of these kits on Amazon. They come in blue and red plastic cases that are all the same that are really good at collecting chips. But uh, you know, the tea nuts that come with this might not match your particular mill, and so you might need to modify or make some of your own. First step is to take some measurements. So you're gonna measure the width of the narrow and the wide parts, and then you need to measure the depth of the top section of the T there. So you're using some sort of a backstop there that I'm holding up against the underside of the T. However, that measurement is actually larger than the depth of a T nut. So why would that be? Well, it's because you don't want the T nut to be sitting all the way down in the bottom of the slot. You need it to be able to slide, first of all, of course, and it also needs to be able to pull up as the something tightens into it, and the top surface needs to remain below the top surface of the table so that you get a clamping action on the top surfaces of the slot rather than just the T-nut tightening against something but remaining loose in the slot. You can save yourself a lot of work by grabbing a piece of steel that's about the same dimensions as the T-nut will be. Uh, you want a little extra room around the outside for machining, of course. If you're trying to match existing T-bolt hardware, make sure to measure the threaded rods and the nuts because you can get misled as to metric or imperial here. The threaded rods, in my case, fit in M10 1.5, but the nuts do not. The nuts uh, reveal that this hardware is actually 3816. Are very close, so they almost fit. Okay, enough faffing about. Let's make some chips. I'm gonna cut my stock to length here, enough room for four T bolts, and uh, they're gonna be each an inch long, and I'm gonna leave a hundred thou between them for saw curve so we can cut them apart later. And so I'm gonna set that chunk up in the vise here and tappy tap tap. You know, I started saying that offhand as a stupid joke, but now people get sad if I don't say it, so I'm gonna keep saying it. Quick sidebar on preparing the stock. You could totally, totally skip this step. I'm gonna square it up like you would for a high precision part, but these are T-nuts, they're utilitarian. So feel free to skip this step if you're just looking to make some chips and you need T-nuts in a hurry. In that case, you can hang out here for the stupid jokes, but skip ahead to where we actually cut the shoulders and make the threaded hole for your T-nuts. I'm gonna use this donated Niagara cutter to do the work here. This is a high-speed steel cutter with a titanium carbonitride coating on it, which is why it has that black color. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me for the part number on this cutter. Uh, it, it actually doesn't show up on Niagara's website, so it must be discontinued or something. Uh, this was donated to the channel, and I actually tried to look it up because people keep asking, and uh, it doesn't uh, apparently exist. So I don't know, it's the 007 of cutters, but I'm sure you can find equivalent cutters on their site. I'm just taking a light 20 thou pass here off this top surface just to get it uh, all flat and machined, and then we'll deburr the fur off of that guy. This is 1018 steel, so it can make some pretty nasty burrs but that's all smooth and nice now. So now we'll put it back in the vise with the machined side against the fixed jaw, which is standard practice for squaring up stock. And then I'll put a piece of round bar on the movable jaw to keep the unmachined surface from influencing the squareness of the setup. And then we tappy tap tap that in and we'll do another light facing pass on this edge again, just to get it machined and square. And now we have two flat surfaces that are 90 degrees to each other. So we're gonna set that back up in the vise with that machined 90 degree corner in the lower rear portion of the vise. And then we'll take a cut across this top face again. And now that we have a machined surface down against the parallels, we can bring this surface to dimension in this axis for the final part. So I'm just taking a light facing pass and then I measure to see where I'm at and then I can start dialing in some heavy cuts. So I'm going 70 thou depth of cut here for each pass, which is uh, where this cutter seems to be happy as a maximum on this mill. 
let's just take a moment to appreciate this lovely cutter chewing through some steel. clean up our toys here and we should have just enough left for a finishing pass so one more check to see where we're at on our dimension and we got a few more thousands to go so I'm going to take that off in a finishing pass and now we are on dimension for our prototype there and now we got some deburring to do. This is a great shot of some of the really nasty burrs that 1018 steel can make. With that last pass deburred, we can set up for our final square and cut now. So we've got machined surfaces on both vice jaws and down on the parallel. So we don't need the round bar anymore. And so we just touch that guy off, set our zero, and then I'm gonna dial in another 70 thou cut here because I know we have a way to go on this dimension. And then we'll lock the quill and plow our way through that. As with any machining operation, but especially with heavy cuts like this, I've got the head down as close to the work as I can, and I'm moving the quill as little as possible for maximum rigidity. I want that quill to be as retracted as I can get away with. I'm dialing in the depth of cut with the quill just for convenience, because doing all of that manipulation of the head is quite a pain in the patootie. But uh, I'm also, of course, locking the quill on every pass. And on really heavy cuts, it doesn't hurt to lock the axis of the table that you're not using either, just to, again, keep everything as rigid as possible. After that squaring up now, we have, as you can see here, the silhouette of our T-nut. So that's all looking good. We just need to put the shoulders on that stock now. And you can see how I've got the length here for four of them. To cut these shoulders, I need to know what the final depth needs to be. So I've got 250 thickness on the lower portion of the T there. So I'm going to set up to cut that. And I need the right height of parallel, so an easy trick for this is to put the stock down first and then you can quickly iterate through parallels above it and just check how much of the parallel is sticking up. And make sure that you're going to have enough material above the vice jaw to make the cut that you need. You also want to make sure that you've got enough meat there on the vice jaws clamping that material. And then one last double check to make sure that we've got the height above the vice jaw so that we're not going to hit it when we go to cut our shoulders. Because T-nuts are symmetrical on their long axis, I'm edge finding on one long edge, zeroing the y-axis, edge find on the other, hit the half function on the Y, and now we have the center line of all of our row of T-nuts, which makes it very easy to set up our cutter. Always take advantage of symmetry on the part whenever you can, makes setups much quicker. So now when I dial in zero on the Y, you can see that we are centered on that axis. So now the cutters I'm gonna use here are one roughing mill and one finishing mill. This is totally optional. You could just do this with a finishing mill if you like, but uh, the roughing mill will let me do this first shoulder cut in one pass. And so we bring our cutter down close to the work, lock the column. To set up our cutter, we move half the width of the material plus half the width of the cutter minus the depth of cut horizontally that we want, which puts us at 477 thou. It doesn't hurt to do a little sanity check with the depth measuring on the caliper there. And you can see that we are in fact the width of the T-nut minus the shoulder that we're gonna cut. So we are in the right place. And we're gonna need some cutting fluid on there and away we go. Now what I didn't show you is that I actually moved the cutter 10 thou further away from the final dimension before making the cut because I want to do a finishing pass of 10 thou with the finishing mill. If you were just doing this all with a finishing mill, obviously you would not do that part. You'd just go right on dimension and make your cut. Although you may not be able to take the full depth or full width of this cut in one go with a finishing mill, depending on the you know size and rigidness of your mill. Next, we'll make our roughing pass on the other side. So we're at 487 on one side, and I move the y-axis to negative 487 on the other side. You can't see the negative sign there because of the light shield on the DRO, but uh, the nice thing about centering the cutter on a symmetrical part feature like this is that it's very easy to flip to the other side just by flipping the sign on your DRO. We don't have to do any kind of math or anything to set up the same shoulder cut on the other side of the part. And look, all of this edge finding and uh, cutter math is totally overkill for a set of T-nuts. You could easily just touch off on both sides of the part and move in the depth of shoulder you want and cut it, and they would be just fine. So I'm just showing you again some highfalutin ways to do this, but uh, as a first milling project, if you just want to touch off on those shoulders and move in, you'll be fine. And here you can see the striated finish left by the roughing mill. So we'll be cleaning that up with our finishing mill. Now I'm gonna swap out my roughing mill for the finishing mill, and I'm gonna to touch off on the bottom surface of our shoulder there, but not the side. And then I'm gonna zero my quill there in case I need this spot again. And then I'm gonna to move to my final dimension that I want, 477, and that'll be a 10 thou cut. And so now we can make our finishing cut. So we're just skating the bottom surface, but we're making a cut on the side because the roughing mill makes a nice cut on the bottom. It just leaves a roughing finish on the sides that we need to clean up. 
You'll note that I'm doing all conventional milling here, no climb milling. So the back side is cut right to left and the front side is cut left to right. Here you can see what a nice finish is left by that finishing mill. Just takes away those roughing marks. Very nice. And clean up our toys once again. And that finish is fantastic. Very happy with that. So once again, we'll do some deburring here and then we're gonna be ready to move on to the next step. There's our T-shaped blank ready to be cut into T-nuts. Looking good so far. So we need to cut this guy apart. I'm gonna make four pieces. So I'm gonna put some Sharpie on the top there. And then I'll just mark out the lines between all the T-nuts where we're gonna make cuts. And then while you're watching this chunk of video, I'm gonna go down in the comments and delete all the people telling me not to use my calipers this way. To cut the T-nuts apart, I'm gonna use a slitting saw, but uh, this is way overkill. You could absolutely do this with a band saw or a hacksaw or any other method that you like, but the slitting saw is actually gonna save us a step here later. So I'm showing it to you and also just because slitting saws are super cool. But be mindful of uh, where that part's gonna go when it comes off the top like that, because, you know, first three rows might get beamed. What's cool about slitting saws is that they are a machining cutter, so they leave a very, very nice finish, and they make a perfectly square cut if properly set up. So that'll actually save us having to face the ends of these guys later on. And you might try using a chip brush to catch the part, but that won't work either. Final cut has to be done on the end of the vise because I can't get clearance for the saw above the vise. So I'm clamping it on one end and I'm using one of the parts that we cut to clamp on the other side and keep the vise jaws from getting canted. It's always a good idea when you're clamping at the end of the vise. And I've got a piece of paper in the piece that I'm cutting to make sure that it gets clamped slightly tighter than the other one. Get rid of that slitting saw now. These guys I just let drop onto a block of wood because there's basically no way to hold it while loosening the drawbar without ending up in the emergency room with severe lacerations. Speaking of lacerations, if you're wondering why I'm wearing one glove, well, I'm trying to conserve gloves right now. And if you're watching this in the spring of 2020, you know why, but uh, I have a nasty uh, cut on my left hand that I'm trying to keep clean, hence the Billie Jean protocol. And so now I'm gonna edge find on one end of this T-nut so that we can establish our length. And remember that two of these guys still have unmachined ends. They were at the ends of our overall blank. The ones in between have been machined by the slitting saw, but they still need to be cut to length. So I've got an end stop set up there as well. So this setup is repeatable and I don't have to move the cutter between each T-nut. I just have to make an end pass on each one and they'll all come out the same length. If you used a hacksaw or a bandsaw to separate your T-nuts, then you'll want to face the ends of each piece first and then you can use this repeatable setup to face the other ends and get them all to length in one pass. Next, I'm gonna center drill each T-nut to prepare for making the threaded hole in the center. And uh, once again, we didn't have to change anything in our setup because we edge found on the end and we already had the Y axis centered from before. So it's easy to find the center there for the hole. So I center drilled each one using our repeatable setup. And then I drill with the tapping size for 3 8 16 in my case, again, using the repeatable setup to do the operation on each part as we go. It saves a lot of time on tool changes. And we'll dig into the old tap and die drawer here. And I'm gonna grab a 3 8 16 taper tap because these are through holes. And I'm gonna set up my spring-loaded tap follower in a collet there, and then we just tap these holes. Lots and lots of cutting fluid here, and away we go. At this point, if you have a chamfering tool that would be suitable, it would be good to do that operation on all four T-nuts now. I don't have one that will fit in the mill and be the right size for these holes, so I'm gonna deburr these guys by hand over on the bench. So we'll use a Noga tool here to deburr the holes. There's links to buy this tool in the description down below. That's looking good so far. And then we have a lot of little teeny edges to deburr. So for that, I'm gonna break out the needle files, put on a podcast and spend some quality Zen time filing. And there's our final T-nuts all deburred and looking pretty fine. There's one more little mechanical detail we need though. You may have noticed that commercial T-nuts don't allow you to thread all the way through. They bottom out. And that's so that the threaded rod doesn't tend to thread itself through the T-nut when you're trying to tighten the bolts on the top. You want the threaded rod to bottom out and become tight in that T-nut so that uh, you're threading one end at a time when you're setting up clamping hardware. Our T-nuts don't work that way. The rod threads all the way through. So the rod would tend to twist as you're tightening hardware and that's a problem. So easy to fix, just set it up in the vise take a punch and just distort the last thread in each hole. Just a few taps in a few places on that bottom thread is all it takes. And now when we thread this rod in, you'll see that just like the factory T-nuts, it bottoms out 
and it won't go any further and that becomes tight and now you can tighten hardware that's on the other end and it won't thread through just like we want. Okay, let's talk finish. I'm gonna cold blue these. My go-to would normally be Brownells Oxfo Blue, but I have this big jug of Jax that I'm trying to use up. And Jax works well when the parts are small enough to fully immerse as these T-nuts are. So we'll start by cleaning these guys up with acetone. This is very important. Success in cold bluing is dependent entirely on how clean the parts are and how good your machining surface finishes are. So you can see how shiny that part is now that we've cleaned it with the acetone. So now we'll pour some of the Jax metal blackener in here and drop those guys in. It's pretty magical. As soon as you dunk them in there, they immediately turn black. And uh, some of the corners and uh, outskirts and stuff take a little more time, so leave them in there for 30 seconds. When they first come out of there, they're really black, just blacker than the devil's carbon fiber fiddle, but they won't stay that way. We gotta rinse them off to stop the reaction. And then once we dry them and give them a little bit of a buff, a lot of that initial blackening is gonna come off on the paper towel. And when you're done, cleaning these guys up, giving them a little wipe down, they'll come out kind of a gunmetal blue-gray, and uh, they call it cold bluing because at this point you can scuff it up again with like some triple zero steel wool and darken them again, and the more times you do that, the bluer they will get. And uh, if you have any missed spots like this, then uh, that means that there was a spot of oil or something there, and you can just clean that up again and redunk it. The last step is to give them a bit of an oiling. I'm using whey oil here, but any old oil will work. Just rub it in there and it'll get kind of absorbed into the surface. And then you can wipe off the excess with a paper towel and they will come out very, very nice. The cold bluing has some uh, corrosion resistance on its own, but the oil really seals the deal, so to speak. And here's our final T-nuts. And once again, you do not have to make them this nice. I took the effort to do this because it was fun, but these are utilitarian tools rough millimeter, whatever you got, and they will function. That's all you need to worry about for your first milling project. Okay, let's see these guys in action. Uh-oh, they're supposed to be T-nuts. Oh, phew, okay. I thought we made them upside down there for a second. So if we got all our dimensions right, they'll slide into the T-slots nice and easily. And let's say hypothetically, we're gonna clamp this titanium bolt down to the table, as one does. And you can see how we can thread the hardware in there and you can see how the top of the nut has remained below the surface of the table so that if there was something clamped against the table it would have a clamping action and because we distorted that final thread the threaded rod twisted in there and we were able to tighten the nut on top with no problem so that is a set of very fancy t-nuts I hope you will try this as your first milling project. I think this is a really great one. There's no tolerances to worry about. Everything's very forgiving and the finishes don't matter and you can make something that functions in your shop and have a good time doing it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. Consider supporting me on Patreon and we will see you next time.